Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Dorset Historical Society third Thursday lunchtime lecture for November 2019. My name is John Mathewson. I'm the curator here. And oh my, oh my, are we in a for a treat today? We get to hear the last of the Jackknife Carpenters and longtime tool collector Ted Hopkins talk about the history of Chiselville. And he has an even guest with him who he'll introduce later. He's really, I'm really happy he's here too. So, um, hold on to your seats and welcome Ted Hopkins. <laughs> cell phone with me, I'd say my mother's calling and I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank you for inviting me. It's an honor and privilege for me to be here in the Dorset Historical Society. I've been a carpenter for 61 years. When I was 83, I went to four days a week. And when I'm 93, I'm going to three and I'm not a long range planner. I've just left it right up in the air. <laughs> I work for my oldest boy. Uh, we have a big shop and we do a lot of mill work. Uh, we do a lot of remodeling. And I've worked in Dorset a great part of my life. And I would like to sh share a few of my experiences in Dorset with you. We worked for Dr. McKinley up on, in Dorset Hollow. And he called us up and he said he had a real problem. Uh, he said a porcupine has ate all my carnivores and they're all mahogany and they're all fluted. And he said he went around and he ate every one. So I, was, I looked at the job and I said, not a problem. We have a big shop. I can make them all. He says, we got to kill the porcupine. I says, baloney. We spent weeks training that bastard. We <laughs> 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 so what do you think you are? We are foolish? <laughs> I built a greenhouse for the kings up in Dorset Hollow when they first came here. I can remember that year, they paid forty thousand dollars. They got three houses in a farm, and in a farm, and we all sat there and laughed. And said those city suckers that buy a farm that's gone defunct, they're nuts. <laughs> I built a greenhouse for them, and on the brochure it said a woman and her twelve-year-old son built it on a weekend. It took me and another carpenter two weeks to build it. I never could figure out whether it was us or the, or what the what. Robin, I worked up to Dr. Magruder's. I remodeled that three times up on Nichols Hill. Um, and that house was brought up in, in seven, was built in 1776 under Quabbin. I think there's about 40 of them here, a lot of them in Dorset. I worked on almost every one of them. So there was a Mason's helper there. And I said to the Mason's helper, I said, uh, this house was built in 1776. And I said, I worked for some of the carpenters that brought it up here in 1929, 1930. And, Two weeks later, he says to my boy, just how goddamn old is your old man? <laughs> <laughs> two, two years ago, we repaired the post on the front of the building, and inside the post was a note. It said, uh, December 3rd, 1911, eight inches of snow in Mr. Griffith. Uh, and I showed him the 1911, and the guy said to me, did you know him? I said, Jesus Christ, I don't look at the holy <laughs> At this point, I would like to tell you why I'm here today. Uh, I was a guide, and I read where there was going to be a talk on Chiselville, and I was excited. Oh, boy, I'm going to go. I, I, you know, I'm always an avid tool collector, and I said, geez, I, I don't want to miss that. Well, as I read on, I found out my name and I was going to give the talk. Well, I, and I called my good friend Jim Hayden and told him I'm desperate. I need him uh, help. And he wrote the book on Chiselville, uh, did all the research. Uh, one, one of the things there that I tell people, I'm one of the biggest liars that ever came down the pike because I always told everybody there was a 25 foot overshot water wheel in Chiselville. The largest water wheel in Vermont. 
and the second largest in the United States. Well, that's baloney. There was never such a wheel as that. And Jim discovered that and found it. So uh, I, it just gets me when you hear all this stuff about history and so forth, but they don't really get the facts. So I'm on a thing to get the facts. And uh, so we've got uh, Jim here and I'll, Jim Hayden and, and his wife did a lot of the work. It's delightful people and probably the most knowledgeable person on Chisholm you'll ever find. Jim. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Ted called me up the other day and said he wanted some help. <laughs> and I consider, I'm sure you all do, Ted is a Vermont trip. Yes. So I would do anything he asked. <laughs> I love his story. <clears throat> oh, this is a, the history of Jezebel that I wrote a couple years ago with the help of my wife. Um, I guess here if anybody's interested. Um, the reason that I wrote it is that my great-great-grandfather was the first owner of the Chisholm uh, factory and um, I grew up right there and so our family's been there since well the, probably around 1840 so the generation after generation this whole thing started uh, and I go through it in my little pamphlet there go through it uh, back when uh, Massachusetts established northern boundary and it's the same boundary as today and it was surveyed in about 1690 or so and they uh, established a fort there called Fort Massachusetts and it was always um, garrisoned and several times run over or attacked by the uh, French Indians. And so when the parties would go out to check on the settlers and so forth, they would come across what they called the wildlands north of Massachusetts. And that's where we live. That's <laughs> Dorset, that's Arlington, that's Sunderland, Sandgate. Those were the wildlands and they the soldiers there started um, uh, thinking about settling. They heard that the governor of uh, New Hampshire was selling ships to townships in what they called the wildlands. They hadn't didn't call it Vermont yet, but um, it, it was talk about corruption. This, this governor from New Hampshire, uh, Benny Wentworth, sold shares in what he called a, propri a propriety, and he sold 66 shares for 100 pounds apiece to these people that would be in charge of establishing a town. So Sunderland had 66 shareholders. Dorset had the same, probably. Arlington had the same. And what had to do was sell the shares. It was up to the proprietors to survey the land, to uh, decide which lots were, how, which to be set out, how large the lots were. And even the proprietors didn't have to do much. I mean, they just had to hire a surveyor and uh, person to keep the records. Then, once they have that all set out and the lots established, and, and it went through a series of subdivisions, each town went through a series of subdivisions. So it would be the first subdivision, second subdivision, third subdivision. Every one of these 66 shareholders got a lot in that subdivision, and they were able to sell. So they made money too. And they sold to the farmers and uh, well, I guess you just basically call them settlers, and that's what that's how these towns develop. But anyway, I, the reason I mention that is the the people from the um, Massachusetts were the first ones to see the land, and they were out there doing their, their um, uh, well, just checking on other settlers and check 
and, and, and trying to drive the French Canadians and the Indians back, they saw the Batten Hill. They saw the Roaring Branch. They saw all these streams and they said, wow, I'd love to have a place here. I'd love to have a place here. So uh, a couple of them, Isaac Searles and a guy named Robinson that were garrisoned at the fort, uh, they got on the list. They paid Benning Wentworth a uh, hundred bucks to get on the list so they become one of the proprietors. And they, uh, uh, in doing that, part of the, uh, the, basically the head of the committees. And they um, would then buy other people out. And those, just those two people owned over uh, 12,000 acres of land, were able to sell it and make good money. And, they, and the, basically the towns flourished. So here's, why I'm, here's what I'm getting to on that whole thing though, is that the, Governor required through the charter that certain lots be set aside. And every town needed a grist mill, so a mill lot would have to be set aside. Every town needed a minister, so a minister lot had to be set aside. And that would be given to whatever minister would agree to come to the and baptize, marry, and bury people. You know, that was a requirement. Just like a grist mill was required to uh, grind the grain, the oats, and so forth that they grew. There was also a school lot, uh, several school lots, so that um, they could be sold to, uh, well, actually, to, for schools to be built on those lots, so excess land to be sold to support the school. And then there was a society lot that supported foreign ministries through the uh, Anglican Church, and a Gleb lot that supported the um, the sale of Gleb Lot, which was uh, support the King of England. And um, the governor also had in each town 500 acres in the corner of the town. So in addition to getting the 100 pounds from every one of those 66 people, he was able to sell 500 acres of land, further enriching himself. So it's, uh, we hear about corruption today, but it, Nothing matches this. Uh, <laughs> so I, I mentioned these public lots, school lot, minister lot, club lot, mill lot, governor's lot, because just by chance, the public lots were established in, in the area of the Chisholm Bridge, and I don't know why. The original deed that, or the original charter that I saw on the first subdivision of land in Sunderland, the lot underneath where the bridge now stands was going to be called the mill lot. But subsequently, as Arlington was a little ahead of Sunderland, Arlington needed a grist mill. And so they <coughs> basically advertised for someone and then take the lot that was on the falls which is the old candle mill, if, if people remember where that was. And Sunderland found out about this and said, it's right on the town line, so we'll give this fellow, whoever accepts it, we'll give this fellow half of a lot. You, Arlington, you give him half a lot, and uh, the grist mill will be going. And that was Remember Baker, was the, was the guy that basically got that deal. So the lot under the covered bridge, originally the mill lot, was canceled out and that became the minister's lot. And the minister um, uh, arrived in 1764, one of the first settlers, and he stayed on that for, well, until 1793. When he retired, and when he retired, a um, there was also a school lot right next to the minister's lot. And, uh, when he retired, a fellow by the name of Rufus Spencer from Arlington, who was a land developer, a uh, speculator, bought bought the minister lot, bought the school lot, sold it to a couple of guys that wanted to develop a tannery under the bridge area there. 
And of course, in addition to having the need for a grist mill and a school and um, and um, a road lot was also there was a road lot sell to pay. But um, you can imagine how how much of a need there was for rawhide. Raw harnesses, rawhide for laces, just rawhide for everything. And so uh, a tannery was raised for about 20 years under the covered bridge. And they had a water wheel, just a small one, and it turned a uh, barrel, large barrel, of um, hemlock bark. The hemlock bark would be stripped from the, of the trees in springtime. It would, be, it would be really loose, and they could strip it right off. small little satellite tannery going and and so they helped with that and they kept it going even though it wasn't making money anymore because the railroads were coming in and, and you could get products cheaper from afar than you could locally uh, depending on the size of the facilities uh, for instance over in Troy that was a huge tannery over there well it finally went completely bankrupt and the grandson of the uh, people that hold, held the Troy tannery, they must have had some uh, interest, uh, money invested in the tannery in Chisholm because they bought, at foreclosure, they bought the whole outfit. And they held it for a few years, and this is when my great-great-grandfather enters. My grandfather was a square maker out of Shaftesbury. And, um, he and another fellow named Royal Irish uh, got together and bought a defunct tannery from this fellow over in Troy and decided to establish a square works in Chisholm. And this is, this, this is what, uh, one of the things I found that this is very interesting to me, you all know about venture capitalism. <laughs> well, this was a perfect example of venture because Royal Irish was a businessman out of Bennington, and he had so many friends that were investors. Uh, and Bennington was, was coming along. There was a lot of business in Bennington at the time. And so the money was available, and they got probably a dozen investors to um, basically buy this old debunk cannery. They bought the house that is my family house. It was called the Hale Farm at that time. It was built in 1796. It was the only building anywhere near there. And they bought that, sold all the farmlands, just kept the, the house, it was a large farmhouse, and uh, turned it into a boarding house. And they used the boarding house for all these workers that came in. All all the mechanics that were necessary in developing this huge water wheel that Ted spoke about and all the other mechanics associated with it. Uh, and the, the neat thing my wife was able to find was that in the 1860 census, the, that was about the first time they ever listed the occupations of the people that they would ask, you know, how long have you lived here and so forth and so on. And that boarding house was just full of mechanics and workers for the chisel mill. And um, there's pictures in, in this little pamphlet here of the old chisel mill, and it was a huge building, just a huge And now Ted mentioned that the water wheel was supposedly 25 feet high. Well, turns out I found the 
contract in the town records and it was only 14 feet high. <laughs> but I measured through the pictures here, I measured the dam that was above the water wheel and that was 25 feet high. <laughs> so that's, I think, where the where that, that came from. Um, and it's a <coughs> of hydraulics that you have to have a certain head above the water wheel in order for it to be efficient. So 25, that would be about uh, 11 feet of head above the water wheel. Um, so, in 1853, my great-great-grandfather and Royal Irish bought this place, and they got all these investors, and all the, and they, they built a, a um, actually a three-part factory building right under the bridge. Well, it wasn't under the bridge at that time, I have to mention something else. The covered bridge was 200 feet to the uh, east of the the building that they built, and in uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit. In 1869, they had a huge flood like they, we had with Sandy, and it just washed everything out, washed the bridges out, and washed all the sawmills out up on the mountain. There was nothing. Washed the road out. The road was completely gone, just like a few years ago it was gone. Um, but they, they built a huge, huge factory, and so it required all this investor's money. And I think they were having some hardship times, my great 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 Irish, because they sold in, uh, they only did it for two years, and then they sold to an uh, outfit called um, Douglas and Bottom, and they were out of Shaftesbury also, <laughs> and they were still. Uh, square makers also. And so that infused a bit more money, but even they didn't last very long. Um, they stayed on as supervisors, and actually it's called the Douglas Manufacturing Company. Um, they owned it about three more years, then they sold it to the largest tool maker in New England uh, called Oates Ames. And I think Ames still makes tools. But uh, he was a senator uh, in the United States Senate and very wealthy man. And he, th his family then ran the Chiswellville factory until about 1876. So he was the longest standing owner. And the, uh, the peak of the Chiswellville factory was probably at the end of the Civil War, between 65 and 70. They had about 50 people working there. Um, when I grew up, um, uh, my grandpa's house was the old boarding house. And we would go over there, and there's this ticket counter was still there, uh, where people would come in and they and they do their uh, sign up, register to stay overnight or whatever. <coughs> and then upstairs they had a ballroom. And the ballroom was uh, domed, you know, plastered. And they had a bandstand at one end for, uh, you know, local entertainment. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that played a big part in the early Chisholm factory when it was being built. There was a fellow that designed the water wheel, um, and I, I forget his name right now, Owen, Owen Scott, I believe, and um, he was only 22 years old, but he was a genius, and he was recognized genius at Bennington, and he was a millwright, and he worked for his grandfather or his uncle, I can't remember which, who was a famous millwright also, and he developed this water wheel. 14 feet in diameter, 12 feet wide, with three rows of buckets, two on the outside, one on the inside, and there were 20 buckets on each one of these, and it was huge power, huge, so much more power than the Shaftesbury uh, Eagle Square area, 
And so uh, it was basically unlimited power for the time. Interesting to note that he went on to become really famous. Uh, the Civil War came around and he developed a mill that was able to process explosive powders. And he basically uh, uh, provided all the explosives for all the shells, all the munitions for the Civil War, at least on the other side. And then when westward expansion happened after that and the railroads going west, he provided all the explosives for the uh, the mountain passes and so forth, laying the track, so forth. And I believe Olin, the name Olin, is still prominent in uh, munitions, uh, <coughs> shells and cartridges and so forth that you can buy. So all this history was something I had no idea of, but about going through all the town records and so forth. Um, that basically gives you the history of how it started, and it turned over so rapidly because so much money was re wheel. Uh, so the, there was an overshot wheel and an undershot wheel, and uh, the undershot powered the uh, grinders and millstones for uh, finishing off the chisels. Now, Ted has a lot of uh, chisels here, and I'll hold one up, uh, basically get through the history here. I'll just mention that um, the Ames company sold the uh, business in around 76 and my great great grandfather who owned it at the first was the one to buy it at the end <laughs> but um, they couldn't keep uh, steam power had come out at that time and they couldn't compete and so um, they really never made a comeback and he was drowned in an accident in Warren Brook uh, going over to get the payroll and he was drowned and when he drowned um, that was the end, and they uh, basically, uh, through, through Ted's research actually, uh, this is something I didn't know until I started talking to Ted. There was a fellow named George Carey who was a master forger there, and he, after my great 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 died, he operated it with another fellow, um, can't think of his name, but uh, they operated it for five more years, but they couldn't make a go of it, and so they returned to farming. So that's what that, that's how that happened. But I'll go over a little bit. I did do some research into the chisels, and um, Ted will, of course, show you when I'm done talking here about all the various types. But um, I found it I found it really interesting. And um, we've always heard that they had a proprietary method for making such high quality chisels at the chisel. Even today, they're considered very high quality, and Ted will back that up. Um, but the, what they would do is buy bar steel from England. And steel is different from iron in that it has a certain amount of carbon in it. And the carbon is what makes it really strong. And so you can go from 1% carbon, 2% carbon, and anything in between. But uh, chisels, Sheffield, England, they made chisels also. They basically knew what carbon content was the best. And obviously researched that and would get bar steel, over, uh, not much bigger than chisels, um, but 20 foot lengths. And it would come over on the ships. It wasn't that expensive. You could put a lot of on the ship. And uh, 
through the railroad, they brought it up to Chiselville, and they had a what they called a crocodile on the end of the water wheel. Well, the water wheel would be over here, and then there'd be a bunch of machines on shafts going in an opposite direction, 90 degree angle to it. And at the what they call it, it was a huge pair of shears, like three or four feet long shears. And it would all they had to do was bar steel over there. It would be the shears would be operating all the time. They would just cut them. They could cut a dozen at one time, and then the forger would take those and start working on them. And so here's what they did. They have a tang, they have a bolster, which uh, keeps the handle from going forward when the handle is put on there, and they have a neck, and then they have a maker's mark, which is just a stamp that goes on telling where it was made, and then you have the blade. So the forger would take this bar steel, and through a, a trip hammer, which is a hundred pound hammer operated by this shaft that's turning, this water wheel is turning, um, you would have a trip hammer with uh, teeth on the, on the shaft, and it would trip this hundred pound hammer about two or three times every second. So it would be boom, 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 hundred pounds at a time. And the, uh, the forger would make this extremely cherry red hot, and he would forge this tang and the bolster, which was set, it, set in a sort of a die and hammer, would make that shape. And then they would do the neck, and then um, roughly do the blade. Maybe do a dozen, 20, maybe 30 at a time. And then these would be sent over to the grinder. They would not be hardened. They would just be low temperature. So they'd still be fairly soft. And so the grinder would do the fine, whatever size chisel they wanted to make, send it to the forger. The forger would then only heat the chisel up to the maker's mark. He would not heat the neck the bolster or the tang because they wanted to keep that soft because it's hammered and you don't want to have it break. send it to the polisher, and the polisher would um, uh, make, it, make it so that actually it looked like it was, um, it had parallel lines through it the way they did it. Uh, they used an emery wheel and glue and, and, and polished it down. And then it would go back to the, then it would go from the grinder to the um, so there was two different processes. The hardener, the harding, hardening of this chisel was at about 2,000 degrees, cherry red 2,000 degrees. But that would be too brittle to use in, in woodworking. So what they did is they would, at, at the end, when it's all finished and polished and beautiful, they send it to uh, the temperer's uh, room. And that was a dark room. And he would heat it up to about 400 degrees. And it was, uh, according to the, the details I have from uh, Sheffield Steel, it's the only place I could go to get information. It, it, it changed from a brownish color to a straw color. And right at the straw color, they figured that was 400 degrees about. And then they quenched that in whale oil. And whale oil was because it was non-combustible. Whereas petroleum would be combustible and would so forth. Whale oil wouldn't. And so that was basically the final stop. And then it would just be checked again for cracks and so forth and packaged up. They had a handle 
the factory there at the at the mill. They would put handles on if people requested them, or they could be shipped out like this, and carpenters like that could put their own handles on. So um, I was fortunate. One other thing I'll mention: I was fortunate to contact a fellow over at Sheffield, the historian over at Sheffield, um, and um, he gave me. The, he gave me the entire method that Sheffield used to do exactly what Susanville did. And so I put that in the book just so that I don't know exactly if that's what Susanville did, but I'm pretty sure it's close to that. But what was um, sort of sad to me is that two weeks after he sent me this uh, information, he passed away. So I was very fortunate and able to get it because he was one of the only ones that was up to speed on the old methods of making these edge tools. So I think that's all I need to go over. Um, the um, one thing I will, one final thing I will say is that um, my family, especially my dad, was a really good um, historian. He kept all the um, letters that my great-great-grandfather wrote to his children. That's one of the reasons that we know a bunch of this history. So, and uh, I just have wanted to write the history for years and years and years after I retired, I finally did it. Thank you. <laughs> when was the bridge built? relative to the factory. Okay, so the, the original bridge built in 41 uh, was washed out by the 1969 flood. So uh, they got a contract to reach the bridge higher location right over the dam in uh, 1870. And I think it cost I think it cost a total of about five or six thousand dollars to build it. So you're saying 1841 was when yeah. the original was. Okay. I may have said 1941. So no, you didn't. You said 41. Have any other questions? Was your dad Harry Hayden? Yes. Yep. I know your sister Kathy. Oh, yeah. And we lived on Dunlap Farm Road for 25 years. Oh, so. yeah. And I loved that old house. Yeah, well, you remember it. Oh, yes. We tried to restore it. I know you did. Yeah. But when I saw, my dad was a builder. And when I saw those beads and things, when we had it stripped, yeah. there wasn't anything. We, 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 we stripped it completely, hoping to restore it. And um, I was the one that had to tear down the ballroom. Oh, that was just heartbreaking. Oh, yeah. yeah. But um, there were three floors yeah. in the kitchen. So they, <laughs> the floor would rot, and they would put another one right over the top without taking same thing again. And it was all moldy. My father had coughs the last 20 years of his life, and I'm sure it was because of all the mold, because we found green, purple, black, yellow mold all through there. And think of your mother, Nellie. Yeah. She yeah. was a saint. Yeah, she was. <laughs> the grinding, did they use sandstone? An awful lot for grinding stuff? No, but they used... Um, a local stone, and it was harder than sandstone, and um, I believe they got it up on the, not to the Kelly stand, but sort of halfway to the Kelly stand. There's a uh, place up there called Whetstone Bluff, and that's where they had their, uh, that's where they got their really fine uh, stone for uh, doing their size, and probably for this too. Um, uh, they need a hard stone to, to do it, and then for the polishing, they use emery, the glue, and, and put that on the wheel. And they had to keep do it, have had to keep putting that glue on there. Yeah. What's the status of that property today? The building, does any of it exist? No, there's just the foundation of the second shop, mm -hmm. which is down further down the stream, and uh, I took Ted down to see that. Um, 
that's covered with brush, you wouldn't know it. See, unless you knew where to look, you wouldn't find it. It's, I find it really amazing because it, that was a huge building, and now there's nothing to show for it except a few rocks. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty sad. Uh, I bet the aqueduct that was underground goes along that road, that's just a little road down there. I bet that's still there. If you would dig it down, I bet you could find it. Yeah. We found where the water came out for the under, under shot water. Wheel. That's right. So we'll let Ted show you all these wonderful tools. And he has one of the, uh, the most complete collections of any chisel tool in the world. <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of go through them. If anybody's got any questions, the, this, this, this one right here is a Douglas and Bottom chisel. So this was the first year of manufacture. And of course it has the Douglas and Bottom on it. So it was that really, really a rare chisel. Uh, so of course as a collector, you look for all that and the names and then they'll have different names. And all those people years ago were in business to make money. They weren't concerned about tool collectors. <laughs> uh, so if they got a cheaper stamp, they put a cheaper stamp on, but so that's, so I'm always looking to Dad, yes. can you hold that up higher yeah. so we yeah. can see? Yeah. And this is for rugged work. This is for like heavy duty mortise and whatever. And then they were all with a wooden mallet like that right there. This is a lignum vitae mallet. <coughs> Stanley made them, and Stanley never put their name on it for some reason or other, but they numbered them. So a lot of people didn't know about that, but uh, they, would, they would number them. Very hard to come by. Here's a Eagle Square boring machine. Eagle Square made two boring machines. They made one was adjustable and one that was fixed like that. Uh, I have both both boring machines, and basically, right on the side of the Eagle Square factory, it said squares and boring machines. And and they stopped making the boring machines in 1900. And of course, one of the things when you turn more is I mean. A lot of these houses in Dorset are all post and beam, and they were all, this was all done on this boring machine. So it got set right there, and he got it plumbed like that, and he got it lined up, and then he bored it like that. And it'll go right down through the electric drills came. Uh, here's the only set of bits that I ever saw in my life, and I talked to people all over the country, and nobody can believe I got them. And, and they're from the Snell Manufacturing Company, and they, they are in the early 1900s. Uh, 1850 and then they went out of business in 1900 and I my just my gut feeling is that when you went and you bought a they can't do anything unless you got a bit so Eagle Square probably bought these Snell bits and I think Eagle Square made that box that box holds five bits and they're all there and, and you have to it's not carpenter made any carpenter can make that uh, and, and it's all beveled and everything like that. So I'm searching, searching to find out if Eagle Square didn't make that. Of course, Eagle Square, you know, made 30,000 beds one year. They were basically a woodworking company to start with. So I was just thrilled to get that. When the guy opened up the trunk and showed me that, I certainly had to call the rescue squad. <laughs> and here's, here's a, the, the you know, the Douglas Manufacturing Company. Well, <coughs> the Douglas Manufacturing Company was also down in Seymour, Connecticut, and there's the Douglas Manufacturing Company, and that right there is for, like, uh, making dowels and so forth, and so that's on, on a bit brace. Of course, the slicks, when, when you bored that, now you had all these holes just like that. Now you had to cut that out like that right there, right? Okay, so you would take your slick and go right down there like that and cut that right out of there. And they were never meant to be pounded. In the first 30 years of my carpenter life, I beat on every one of them with a sledgehammer and ruined them. <laughs> when I became a tool, I realized that was a no-no. But I do have uh, the different ones, and you'll see the, the labels on them. This is the Douglas. And one of the big arguments over the Douglas is that the, the Douglas and East Arlington, Vermont has two S's. It was the Douglas Company down in Massachusetts. And uh, 
So anything with the two S's, and I've contacted the outfits all over the country to be sure, but to the best of my knowledge, the, the, the Douglas, if you see the two S's, that's made in uh, And then they went by width. I think this is like two, two and a half. And that has a name on it. That has a Douglas Manufacturing Company. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some of them had a, like different things they, they put on them too, you know, besides the name. But the Douglas people did not. This is a George Carey and Sons. This one here is rare and rare. Because like Jim told you, George Carey uh, was a master. And when they went out of business, that he made him in his house. I don't believe it. I went down there with Jim and I looked at it. And there's, there's a shack on the back of his house like that. Well, you don't have trip hammers. And I think the rumors are that he had 12 men working for him at one time. So I say he went right over there and used the plant, to the best of my knowledge. But that's just my thinking. And so George Carey stuff is really, really scarce. We did find a George Carey and son chisel and a guy up in Derby, Vermont. And I pulled out all my stops to get it. I had my wife call up and cry on the phone that it was for my birthday. And he still didn't part with it. But I'm still working on it to get it. Because it's the only one that, that I know of. And I just love the George Carey. And then they made these gouges. This, this is a this is a Douglas gouge right here, and I don't know what they were for. In my partner life, I never used a gouge. I don't know, but they made a lot of them, and a lot of them are in good shape. So maybe they didn't use them too much. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, uh, I have a tablet that I look at. And they had one of those, and the guy was making holes with it. Yeah, and then I thought about you know like the fluted columns and all. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But you know, the, 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 the power tools, after the Second World War, the power tools really took over. The chisels today, the saw, <coughs> it, it, it's a whole different world today. And then this, this is the difference. This is a, a tang one. This is what they call a tang. And, and here's, here's a tang one in the finish. I made that handle for it. Uh, so that they went right in like that. And a little bit of a trick. And, uh, I think they took a tapered reamer and when they went in like that, but still quite a thing to make those handles. And you have some of the best maple in the world right here. The Eagle Square, the Stanley and Eagle Square Company, they had a place in Pittsfield and Lawton, particularly because of the maple all over the world to get the maple. So they had that ability to, to make the maple. And in Arlington, they, they had a, I have a book that tells you all the tool, all the, the tool people before now. There was nine tool makers in Arlington. There was none in Manchester, which surprised me. Manchester originally was Factory Point, but but the tool makers in Arlington were all brushback makers. They had what you call a Bolton mill, sawmill like that. Then you had a horse, and you went right up on the side and cut yourself those logs. Then you could make shave and brush handles, all kinds of different things like that. And then, so then a lot of them had a farm, so this supplemented their income. A lot of them, they just needed a little bit of money to survive. So so the tang one. This is an Arlington to a one. And, and what, what, when you really just look at it and you say, well, like the Douglas people were in business a lot longer, and the Arlington Edge Tool people weren't in business that long, so they didn't make that many. They're really hard to come by. And then they have all different handles, and it's always a question whether some carpenter at a later date made the handle. Every carpenter had made when I first started draw shaving. Once you got, you know, like, you could get the wood right off like that, and it was razor sharp. But today, I always say, two bucks down the wild, <laughs> no one to know what they were, let alone how to use them. And here's, here's a, a Whipple square. Uh, and, and, and Whipple was the big wheel in, in the Eagle Square Company. Of course, Douglas was the one that came here. But, but these people were all highly skilled. They got me to give a talk years ago down in Bennington. And I just told them how skilled people were. To take a double bitted ax and walk up on the side of that mountain and cut a cornwood and split it every day, you had to be You know, there was no 911 if you cut your leg. You know, he, you know if you kicked your ax, you know. So they were highly skilled. But, but something said to me, how could you last all this in such a short time? 
Do you have a raise anywhere? I go, oh yeah. I guess it what? I said a hundred people. That's that's how you get the stuff. A guy in a guy in uh, Burlington, Essex Junction, goes to every tool thing all over and he saves everything for her. <laughs> There's another Douglas slick, and that goes with this set right here. And that's, to the best of my knowledge, the only complete set of Douglas chisels in the world. Wow. And that came from a farm a little bit north of Dorset here. And my honest opinion is, the guy. But they were amazed to see him. But that's the only set. There it is. There's the Chiselville Bridge. They hit me up for a donation for, uh, for a Habitat for Humanity or something like that. So I was going to do the Equinox. And I said, boy, am I going to turn all those spindles in for the post? That's a, that's a lot of work to make the Equinox Hotel. So I said, ah, I'll make it simple. I'll get down and do the Chiselville Bridge. Well, when I went down and I did the Chiselville Bridge, when you look at those rafters and those trusses and everything like that is unreal. Um, it sold for a dollars. But I had sixteen hundred in it, so it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that's the way it goes. Um, so that has anybody got any questions on any of this stuff or, and before I forget it, I wanna anybody would like to come and see the we have a Stanley Museum in the house. It takes two and a half hours at a minimum to see it. So if anybody would like to see it, just give me a call. You know, people say, well, I stopped by twice. I say, let's get something straight. This is not like a football game. I'm not sitting on the bench waiting to be called in. <laughs> so let, let me say one more thing before I... Uh, Carbon steel from England was pretty expensive. So what they did for a large chisel like this, they would call um, forge weld it. And they would take the end piece and make this carbon steel, the rest of it, all the way down to the bootleg here, um, would be expensive uh, steel. Just the weld. Or, or the forger would weld it just on the with his hammer and the forge, and you can't even tell where it was done. They were so expert. <laughs> That's how they kept the cost down. You, you know, like today's technology. I mean, like like the heat. I'm sure today's technology. They would tell you that's exactly uh, 421 degrees like that. But, but you just had to look at it, the cherry red and so forth. You know, so I mean, it was a little bit cloudy or. Maybe you had a few last night. The cherry red might be a little different. <laughs> so, so, but so it, it was really because it's sometimes like you years ago you'd buy a handsaw and it'd be really good, and the next guy would buy one that wasn't all that good. So, but but those people were really really highly skilled. Um, I guess I want to kind of close. I'm sure it's getting near the time for you, uh, and I want to thank Jim for for coming. Uh, yes. And I want to thank Jim for being a friend. <laughs> you know, but in this world, you're pretty lucky to have a lot of good friends. And I've had my share and then some. Uh, my goal is, is to get the facts. You know, I try to <coughs> research everything and, and try to get all the facts and, and set history and, and to preserve these kind of things for future generations. There's only three methods really of doing it in my opinion. What one method is museums. One of the problems museums got is, and I understand it completely, that you've got to have stuff people want to see. Okay? How many people want to see Grandma Moses? A lot of people. How many want to see a George Carey chisel? You. You're the only one. <laughs> okay? So, I understand why museums don't. Okay? I understand that. 
historical society, okay? But but they've also got a problem. They got a storage problem. How like my Manchester Historical Society? How much stuff can you store, and where are you going to store it? You know, I've been to museums all over the country. Like a boat museum, the boats and the roof, and the, and the boats are just rotten in the museum. So it's a real problem to to, to have. Another method is private collectors. <laughs> okay, that you'll spend everything possible to get it. I want to tell you one quick story about that. Years ago, I was at an auction, okay, and I have a bridge square. Stanley made bridge squares. They were shaped like this right here. And I had a one and a two, and they're scarcer than hen's teeth. And one came up, it was a patent model from Mr. Robinson out in Wisconsin, who sold it to the Eagle Square Company. So I'm sitting there with my wife, and I was on it for $1,700. And I said, oh, this is stupid. We're getting out. We're getting out. I said, this is crazy. Too much for a square. She said, hit it again. Hit it again. <laughs> I hit it one more time, and I got it. And after the auction, a guy comes up to me, and he says, by any chance, does your wife have a sister? <laughs> It's been a great ride. It's been a great life. You know, you live in any world you want to. You can live in the sailing world, the golf world, the historical society world. My wife and I, we live in the tool world, and I love it. It's been, you know, I spent my whole life carpentering. I do it as a hobby. Uh, I do it for a living. Uh, and, you know, it's me to quit, and I don't want to quit. So, <laughs> well, I guess that winds it up, and I want to thank you for coming, and I want to wish all of you. Thanksgiving. Before we let you go, a couple um, things for you to know. Um, on December 7th, Saturday from 11 to 1, we'll be having our holiday open house. Um, Heidi Stokes is putting that together this year. It'll be um, a special emphasis on Christmas in Vermont in the 1940s, both experienced here and in the films. So stop on by for that, and then December 19th will be the next th Thursday lunchtime lecture, and we won't be having a history lecture. We'll be having someone from Berkshire Bank coming to this awe on the current um, frauds and scams that are out there, especially in this time of year. So history, but very informative and helpful, I'm sure. Um, a quick personal note. Um, if you have nothing better to do, I mean, if you're looking for something to do, <laughs> uh, the first two weekends of December, the Dorset Players are putting on a Christmas carol over at the Dorset Playhouse, Friday and Saturday nights and Sunday afternoons. And I mention this not only to be a community booster, but you'll get to see me sing and dance on stage. <laughs> Let's give it up for Ted and Jim. Thank you for coming.